So we're going to be talking about um, organic gardening. So we're going to be talking about organic gardening as it pertains to um, homeowners, backyard vegetable gardeners. We're not going to be talking about um, certified organic um, selling uh, types of more practices you can do at home for this presentation. Uh, so first off, what is organic? Uh, so the National Organic Program um, was set up and they kind of set the standards for organic uh, food production in the United States. So they are in charge of that certified organic, um, that, that symbol you see, um, you know, there are certain rules and regulations that have to be followed in order for something to be considered organic. And the National Organic Program is in charge of setting those standards. Um, you also see OMRI quite a bit. So that's the Organic Materials Review Institute. And they kind of certify whether or not different products, uh, such as fertilizers, pesticides, can be used in organic production. So if you're looking for an organic fertilizer or, or a pesticide, you can go to the OMRI website and look to see what those different organic uh, products are. And if, if you have a product, if it is listed as, or if, if it's okay to be used in organic production. Uh, as far as what organic is, this is the, the USDA uh, definition of organic. So we are integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices to foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. So that is the, the textbook definition of what organic is. So a little more layman's terms. Uh, so basically, it's a philosophy that supports the health of the entire system. So not only the plants, but also the, the soil, uh, the life in the soil, the soil microbes, uh, beneficial insects that may be in the environment um, that can be controlling pests and stuff. Like that. So it's kind of the whole systems approach uh, to raising food in our case. And then we're going to be using um, some different mechanical, biological methods, cultural methods uh, to grow our plants to help reduce losses with insects, diseases, and weeds. And we'll talk about um, pest management here um, in a little bit and how that works and kind of how that can work in an organic type system. Um, but I'll, kind of the big focus for organic is the soil. So the kind of the idea is to feed the soil and the soil will feed the plant. So making sure we have good, healthy soils that can support uh, our plants is one of the big focuses of organic production. A lot of that is focused on increasing organic matter. So organic matter is that either that living or the once living components um, of the soil. So uh, dead plant material, um, animals, um, stuff that's stabilized into hummus, uh, stuff like humus, stuff like that. Um, it can be a source of nutrients. So as that organic material breaks down, it will release nutrients over time that plants can then take up. Uh, it can be habitat for beneficial soil microorganisms. And you can see that soil food web on this picture here. Uh, so we have fungus, we have bacteria that will break down that organic matter to release nutrients. We have things like earthworms and nematodes, uh, beneficial and pest nematodes. Um, again, that'll, they'll be in that soil and that organic matter feeding on it, um, as well as feeding on other, feeding on pests and stuff like that that may affect our plants. It can also help improve soil structure, so it can improve that soil tilth, um, help prevent crusting and compaction in soils. So organic matter is something we want to have uh, in our soils. And here in Illinois, for the most part, um, we have good amounts of organic matter in most of our soils. So when it comes to uh, nutrition, um, Typically, is we're going to be either using synthetic or organic. In organic production, obviously, you're using organic sources, whereas synthetic, um, that's kind of your traditional, uh, so to speak, agriculture. And we wouldn't be using these sort of synthetic sources uh, in organic production. Um, so these synthetic materials are going to be manufactured, um, going through some kind of manufacturing process to create um, these these fertilizers, the, the, getting these nutrients that the plants need to grow, typically nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and potassium, and PK. Typically, synthetic fertilizers are going to be higher analysis, so you get kind of more bang for your buck uh, when using these. Uh, they also tend to be cheaper. Um, one of the drawbacks, can be a drawback, can be a benefit depending on the situation, but they typically release their nutrients rather rap rapidly compared to organic sources, so you put them down and those nutrients are available almost immediately or, or immediately to the plants. Um, but they don't really do any soil building. Basically, when you're using synthetic fertilizers, 
you're feeding the plant, the plant itself. You're not really concerned with um, kind of building up that organic matter, uh, building up soils, stuff like that. When it comes to organic fertilizers, um, these are going to be derived from plant or animal-based materials. So all of our organic products are going to be kind of quote unquote natural. They're going to come from plants, animals, um, and in some cases, minerals. This can be things like compost, uh, cover crops, or green manures, sometimes they're called, uh, animal manures, um, organic fertilizers. Um, so some organic fertilizers could be something like a blood meal, fish meal, seaweed, bone meal, um, feather meal, basically, you know, again, fertilizers that are made from living organisms. They tend to be lower analysis. They're a lot less nutrient dense compared to our synthetic. Uh, and they break down over time. So those nutrients aren't necessarily all available right away. Um, they will be released slowly uh, into the soil so the plants can uptake it. But they will kind of help build up the soil over time because um, you can be adding organic matter uh, and stuff like that to the soil. Uh, so talk a little bit about some of these different types of um, kind of fertilizers, so to speak, that we can use in organic production or, or that are used in organic production. Uh, compost, this is going to be decomposed organic material. Um, this can be done um, indoors if you do something like a worm composting uh, or outdoors, uh, like this picture here, this three bin system. Uh, and, and for composting, you're going to require three basic ingredients. Uh, your browns, uh, which is a lot of times going to be dead plant material, dead leaves, uh, branches, twigs, uh, and then your greens, which is going to be uh, vegetable waste, fruit scraps, coffee grounds, grass clippings, things like that. Um, and water. Those are the three basic ingredients that you need to create compost. Um, mix those together and then over time those will break down um, into an organic matter into compost. Um, not really going to go into a lot of detail on how to do that. There's other, uh, we've got some four season videos on how to do compost if you're really interested in how that um, takes place. Um, but that is an option. You can do that at home. Depending on where you live, you may not have municipal compost that you can access get that from your municipality. They maybe have it for free. They may sell it. You can buy bag compost. So there are options out there if, if you don't compost or you don't feel like you have an area where you can't compost. Uh, cover crops are also often, are often commonly used in organic production as well. Uh, so these can be grown to restore nutrients and to assist with soil qualities. So if you're growing uh, something um, like peas, um, or clover, something that's something that can fix nitrogen from the environment. You can grow that, help increase the amount of nitrogen available to your plants. Um, you can do stuff that helps uh, prevent um, soil erosion. So a lot of our cover crops that are overwintering can help prevent erosion, um, break up um, compacted soils, things like that. Uh, when it comes time to plant your crops, you, those crops can be removed completely. You lose some of the benefits of using cover crops if you do it that way though. Um, they can be tilled under, so used as a green manure, so somehow killed or tilled into the soil, and then as they break down, they'll release those nutrients. Um, or you may be able to plant um, within that or seed your cover crops um, within your vegetable garden. So typically this is done in the fall, um, late summer, fall. So as your, your tomatoes and stuff are starting to wind down, you can seed your cover crop, get that going um, before we get in, into winter and stuff like that. Uh, they can be grown for short term. So when we talk about cover crops in the winter, you can grow those um, that will winter kill. So they will be killed by cold weather. So you have those for a short period of time. And then that, that dead plant material will still be there. So hold on to the soil, things like that. You could do something like a summer or a warm season cover crop where you're doing that, growing that in the summer. So you have your spring vegetables that you could grow. You plant your cover crop and then you would terminate that and you could potentially plant um, a fall cover crop or fall vegetable crop after that. Um, and when it comes to cover crops, you can mix these together. You can do um, a single species. You can mix them, um, have a grass um, and a brassica or a mustard family plant or a pea family plant. Um, there's ways you can mix these so you can get these different benefits uh, from these different types of cover crops. So when it comes to uh, choosing a cover crop, you kind of need to determine your needs. So why do you want to grow this cover crop? Um, you know, are you doing this to, to build soils? Are you using it to add nitrogen? Um, or do you need, do you have compaction that you need to be broken up? So you're gonna be growing something like a tillage radish, uh, something like that. Do you want them for weed control? Um, so think about what, 
what you want to accomplish when you're picking these cover crops. Um, and there are resources out there for picking cover crops. Um, one of them is the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Um, they have a selector tool right now. The only one they have up is for row crops, but they are working on one for vegetable crops. Um, but even the one for row crops, you can go in there and look at um, the different benefits, the different things that these different cover crop species will provide um, to kind of give you an idea of what you could use them for in your own garden. Um, in this picture right here, um, this is rye, cereal rye. Um, they plant it in my garden. Uh, so I plant this in the late fall. Um, it will start germ it will germinate, start to grow. Um, winter comes, it kind of stops growth and then picks up again in the spring. Uh, and then I crimp that and use that uh, as a mulch in my garden. I don't till that in, I use that as a, as a mulch for weed control uh, in my garden. Um, so that kind of gets into knowing, knowing the features. So something like a, a rye can be a good mulch, uh, your tillage or oil seed radish. Um, some of those can get quite large. Daikon radish would be another name for them. Um, those large tap roots can help break up compacted soils. Um, clover, things like that, again, can add nitrogen uh, to the soil as well. Um, how are you, how's it going to be seeded? Um, can you hand seed it? Do you need to, um, you know, incorporate that in, into the soil some way? Some of them may require some different seeding than others. So again, kind of know what you're going to be planting and what you need to do with it. Um, and then you need to have an exit strategy. So how are you going to kill off that cover crop? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, some of them will winter kill. So when we get cold temperatures, um, those cover crops will be killed and you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, in my case with this rye, I have to terminate that. Um, otherwise it'll just keep growing. So I crimp it. Um, you know, in, in conventional um, agriculture, you could spray that with an herbicide potentially. With organic, that's, that's probably gonna be a little bit tricky. You're probably gonna have to crimp. Uh, green manure, um, so you're gonna be incorporating that. Um, you could cut it. Sometimes you have to make sure you get that cut at the right stage, otherwise you'll get regrowth. Um, again, kind of when you're choosing a cover crop, keep in mind um, how you're going to get rid of that come planting time. Manures are also commonly used uh, in organic production. When it comes to raw manures though, um, you need to be careful with that, especially if you're so we're talking about vegetable crops or focusing on vegetable crops today. Um, you need to be careful with that because there are the potential for pathogens and stuff to be in there with raw manure. So when it comes to raw manure being applied to food crops, it has to be applied 120 days prior to harvest for crops in direct contact with the soil. So that'd be things like carrots, um, leaf lettuces, things like that. If, if that crop that you're harvesting is touching the soil, you have to apply that raw manure 120 days before harvest. Uh, if it's not in contact with something like tomatoes that you have staked up, it's 90 days prior to harvest. So if you're gonna be using manures, they need to be put down in the fall and incorporated into the soil. So there's time for that stuff to break down um, before you are harvesting um, those crops. You can also use aged or composted manure. You basically treat that as a compost. So basically as aged as composted, um, the path pathogens aren't really going to be a concern. Weed seeds um, shouldn't be a concern if they've been composted properly. Um, and you would just apply that like you would a compost. One of the drawbacks for manures is that you could potentially have um, weed seeds in there depending on the type of manure you're using. Uh, so for manure analysis, this is for fresh manure. Um, you can see, again, not very um, nutrient dense. Um, so if you used to go and do a uh, the nursery buying a fertilizer. So you have the NPK, so like a 10, 10, 10 would be 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. You can see here, we're talking about half percent. So again, not a whole lot of, of nutrients present in these. Um, when they are composted, um, they get a little more like, nutrient dense, so to speak. So cattle would be something like a, a two, one and a half, 2.2. Uh, sheep, 1.9, 1.4, 2.9. Uh, then poultry, 4.5, 2.7, 1.4. So as they compost, they get a little more nutrient dense. They lose some of their water. Um, some of those solids and stuff break down. So they get a little bit more nutrient dense, but still nothing like um, our synthetic fertilizers. Um, like I mentioned before, there can be some problems with manure. So not, they have pathogens. Um, that can be uh, of human concern. Um, one reason why you don't want to use uh, pig manure, um, because there are pathogens that can cross from over from pigs to humans. Uh, same thing with your pets. Uh, don't use dog or cat or human waste for that matter either um, because of pathogens. 
some manures can contain weed seeds. So you put that on there, you could be introducing weed seeds um, when you introduce manure. They can't have high salt levels, so you can get um, salt built up in your, in your soils if you do a lot of manure, um, which can affect your plant growth. Uh, and they tend to be low uh, in phosphorus. If you have issues with low phosphorus in your soils, um, manure may not be um, the best option, or you're gonna have to add something else uh, to get the necessary phosphorus that you need. Um, here you can see just some kind of general recommendations on how much manure um, you would be putting down per 100 pounds per 100 square feet um, if you're gonna go this route. So you're gonna be putting on a pretty good amount um, of manure to get um, kind of the nutrients that you need. Uh, so again, kind of the pros and cons of, of organic uh, type fertilizer. So the, again, the pros, you're improving that soil tilth, you're, you're adding to that organic um, material in the soil, which is good for plant growth. Uh, because you're building that soil, it's going to be good for the soil organisms, um, help promote the growth of those organisms in the soils. Again, help create a better, healthier soil for you. They do release nutrients slowly. Uh, so we have a little bit less of a risk of, of losing some of those nutrients, uh, less nutrient runoff, stuff like that. It can still happen, but it's, it doesn't happen as much, uh, let's say, compared to a, a more synthetic fertilizer. And we do have lower burn potential because these aren't as nutrient dense. Uh, there's less of a chance that you're gonna get fertilizer burn. Again, it can still happen, especially if you're using a lot of manures and the salts, but it's a little bit less of a risk compared to synthetic. Uh, and again, but there are some drawbacks. There's, there's pluses and minuses to everything out there. Uh, they tend to be more expensive, again, compared to our synthetic type fertilizers. We do potentially have those health concerns if you're using raw manures, uh, stuff like that. So again, making sure you're putting those on the year before and incorporating those to kind of alleviate some of those concerns. Again, manures can have too much salt in them uh, and cause issues uh, with plants. They are relatively low nutrient content per volume, so they're not as nutrient dense, so you have to add more of it typically. And because of this, it can take longer to correct any nutrient deficiencies you may have in your soil. So it could be something where you take a hybrid approach where you're using, you're adding these organic type fertilizers to your soils, but then you're supplementing with synthetic types until you can get um, that soil built up and then you can kind of cut out. The synthetic fertilizers, if you have a lot of nutrient deficiencies, would be a route you could go. So when it comes to actually starting seeds and stuff, um, do your seeds need to be uh, organic if you're growing organically? If, if you're certified organic, uh, again, this is if you're if you're selling the stuff, you're selling more than five thousand dollars a year. You have to be certified organic. You do. The exception to that is if you are growing something where no cert where no certified organic seed is available, uh, then you can use um, kind of conventional seed as long as it's not treated. For homeowners, if you're following kind of the letter of the law when it comes to organic, yes, you want to grow organic seeds. Um, it's not as big of an issue as it used to be, but there are still there are going to be cultivars and, and stuff out there that you cannot find organic seed for. Um, real popular garden crops, tomatoes, things like that. There are a lot of organic seed options. Others, there's not many options out there. So that's going to be kind of a, a personal decision. Do you want to use um, organic seeds? Again, letter of the law, yes, you would. If, if, if it's available, yes, you would. But um, that's kind of up to you. Uh, as long as you're not buying treated seeds, it's really not going to be uh, too much of an issue. Uh, GMO crops. You know, a lot of times we see in seed catalogs, you know, GMO free stuff like that. Um, and yes, in organic production, you can't use GMO crops, um, but there really aren't any GMO seeds that are going to be widely available to homeowners. Most of the crops that are GMO, you're not going to be growing anyway. Soybeans, field corn, sugar beets, alfalfa, things like that are not things we typically grow in a backyard garden. Also, when you're buying GMO crops, typically you're signing an agreement um, that you know, you're not gonna save seeds and, and, and stuff like that. They're not gonna, companies that sell GMO seeds are not gonna waste their time selling them to homeowners. So a lot of times that's more of a marketing ploy than anything else. So don't get, don't get kind of worked up about, you know, we're GMO free. That stuff's not really available to homeowners to begin with. 
Um, so then we'll talk a little bit about um, pest management and kind of how we can do that organically in our gardens. So ideally, not only with organic gardening, but just gardening in general, we wanna be trying to use IPM or integrated pest management. So this is a comprehensive approach to controlling pests, whether that be insects, weeds, plant pathogens, you name it, with environmentally and economically sound practices. So in the case of insects, uh, you know, we have this large population, we're gonna use our IPM strategies to get these down uh, to a lower, more manageable level or to a level where they're not causing noticeable damage. We're not necessarily elim completely eliminating pests um, from our landscapes or from our gardens and stuff like that. We're getting them to a point where they're not causing noticeable damage or where we're losing you know, a significant amount of our harvest, um, things like that. So when I talk about IPM, a lot of times I talk about it as a, as a structure. So you know, at, any good building is gonna have a good foundation. So think of your pest manager program as a building, you have to have a good foundation. So you need to know what pests are out there uh, for the crops you're growing, when they normally show up, what parts of the plant they attack. And then you can use that information to go out um, and scout and then use that information to kind of inform how you're going to manage your pests. Typically we're using four different techniques for IPM. So we have our cultural, physical, biological and chemical control measures for our pest management program. So one of the most important things we can do in our gardens is going out and scouting, whether that's visual inspection. So going out ideally at least once a week, go out into your garden and check your plants. Turnover leaves, a lot of times uh, small or small soft bodied insects, aphids, white flies, things like that like to hide on the underside of leaves or at the growth points of plants. So go out and inspect your plants to see what is out there. The sooner you find a pest problem, whether it's insects or diseases, the sooner you can start taking steps to address that and kind of before it gets out of control. If it's, if it's widespread, it gets much more difficult to control. If you catch it early, it's easier to manage that problem. So going out, visual inspections. And then if you see something going on with your plants, you need to determine if it's actually a problem or not. So here we've got a couple different plants that have holes in them. Say you're out in your garden, um, you see something like this. On the left there, that is cabbage worm damage to cabbage. This is obviously something we want to manage. Uh, on the right, that is leaf cutter damage. Now this is to a tree, it's not to a vegetable, but this is something that we probably don't want to manage because leaf cutter bees are pollinators and we want to encourage pollinators in our gardens and stuff. So identifying the pest is important too to determine if we actually need to uh, try to manage it. Here we've got another issue. Both of these are on squash. On the left, we have frost damage. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, so if you see something like that, don't go out and spray because it's not gonna help anything. On the right-hand side, we have downy mildew. There are things we can do for this uh, to try to uh, slow down the spread and, and reduce the spread of, of this pest. So again, proper identification is going to be important when it comes to drying, trying to manage our pest problems. So first off, we've got our cultural management. So we're trying to, for this, we're trying to maintain our plant health. Uh, and this is probably the most important one when it comes to organic production, um, how we set up our garden and, and the decisions we make before, even before we plant our garden can go a long way in managing a lot of our pests. So making sure we have the right plant in the right place and planting it at the right time. So we don't wanna be planting tomatoes, you know, in March or April in Illinois. It's too cold more than likely we're gonna get a frost and they're gonna die, or the soils are gonna be too cool and they're just gonna sit there and do nothing. Uh, and it's gonna provide an opportunity for pests to get on those. Uh, making sure we have proper fertility. So we want a soil test at least every three years or so to make sure again, we have proper nutrients in our soils and then we can address that if we need to. Growing resistant cultivars. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about resistant cultivars in a little bit. Uh, crop rotation, making sure we have proper plant spacing so we have good airflow through there um, to try to reduce uh, disease problems, things like that. Good sanitation, getting out disease plant material, uh, providing mulch to help with water um, retention in the soil, um, weed management, uh, things like that. So if you don't have a garden already, or maybe you do, 
Um, site selection is going to be important. Where we place our garden, again, can affect, uh, can kind of decide how it's going to be affected by different things in the environment. So when we're talking about vegetable gardens, we want a minimum of six hours of direct sun a day. Ideally, we're gonna have more than that, but a bare minimum of six hours of sunlight a day. The vast majority of our vegetable crops that we're growing need full sun to grow properly and produce properly. We wanna have good soil and good drainage. So you can see that, that diagram at the bottom there. We wouldn't wanna put that our garden down in that trough there. Water is gonna flow down there. Soils are probably gonna to be too wet. You're gonna have a lot of root rot problems, a lot of soil-borne pathogens in there as that water flows down. Um, so making sure you're not planting in low areas um, can be helpful. Most of our, our vegetable crops do not like having wet feet for the most part. Having it close to a water supply. Uh, you don't want to be dragging hoses or hauling buckets, what have you, for a couple hundred feet to water your garden. Have that close by so you can water your plants if it gets dry. You want to avoid trees and shrubs. They can cause shading, they can compete for water and nutrients with our plants. Uh, ideally, flat or gently sloping uh, soil or topography where you're placing your garden. And the closer you have it to your house, a lot of times, the more you'll take care of it. If it's out in the backyard, quite a bit of ways, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. If you see it all the time, you're a lot more likely to actually go and, and do stuff in your garden and, and notice it and look at it more often. I mentioned crop rotation is important. Um, this is important for disease. It can also be important um, kind of for nutrients as well. So rotating plant crops. So if, if you plant crops in the same spot every year, a lot of times you will have buildup of diseases and sometimes insects too. So we wanna to try to rotate that stuff around the garden. I realize in backyard gardens, a lot of times it's easier said than done. We have limited space. Um, but try not to grow your tomatoes in the same exact spot every year. If you've got them in one corner, put them in a different corner the following year, rotate those around your garden. And it's important, you not only grow tomatoes in the same spot, but also related plant species. So peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, potatoes, those are all solanaceous plants. So you wanna rotate those around the garden. Brassicas, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, kale, um, legumes, gonna be stuff like peas, beans, um, Cucurbits, our vining plants, our cucumbers, our squash, our pumpkins, our melons, things like that. These are all related to one another. So you wanna rotate those around the garden. Different plants also have different nutrient requirements. Some of them will feed more heavily on different nutrients uh, than others as well. So if you rotate those around, um, you can kind of alleviate some of that nutrient, some of that nutrient load that those plants are taking up uh, as well. Um, ideally, when it comes to crop rotation, especially when it comes to pests, you don't you want to have kind of like a three-year rotation. So move them around the garden. Should be ideally at least three years before you grow them in the same spot again. And again, I realize it's easier said than done a lot of times in backyard gardens. Disease resistance can also be important uh, when we're selecting our plants. So plants are going to vary in their susceptibility to diseases. So if a plant is susceptible, um, it's prone to develop a disease uh, when, that when it's infected by that particular pathogen. Um, so basically, if, if you have a susceptible tomato plant to early blight, the pathogen for early blight gets on that tomato, it's going to develop if the conditions are, are right. Tolerant, those plants may get are probably going to get infected still, but it doesn't cause the damage. Um, we don't get, typically get severe damage. You can still get a crop out of that may get a little bit less, but you're still gonna be able to harvest something. Resistant, um, typically they're not gonna get diseased if we have really good environment for it, they can get diseased, but again, it doesn't really do a tremendous amount of damage to them. And immune means they can't get infected by a particular pathogen. So we really wanna be looking for resistant um, cultivars to different diseases and stuff, particularly if you've had issues with a certain disease in the past, look for resistant cultivars. If there aren't resistant cultivars, try to find something that's tolerant to that disease. And that can go a long way in managing a lot of your disease problems in your garden. Now we have our physical and our mechanical ways of controlling pests. So we're going to try to physically eliminate pests um, from the garden. So that could be cultivating, uh, cultivating weeds. If you've had issues with tomato hornworm, something like that, you can cultivate the soil to destroy those pupa and stuff that may be in the soil hand-picking pests, 
um, removing diseased plants, pulling weeds, uh, barriers, that top picture there is a floating row cover to keep insect pests off. We have our biological. So this we're using natural enemies, insects, uh, mites, things like that to control uh, our pests. So we have things like predators. So uh, on the left there in the middle, that is uh, aphid lion. That's the larva of a lacewing. Um, it's feeding on an aphid. Bottom right corner there, those are lady beetles. So both the adults and the larvae will feed on small soft-bodied insects like aphids. Um, parasites, parasitoids. So top right picture, that is a wasp that is laying an egg inside that aphid. That wasp egg will hatch, develop, eat the inside of the aphid and kill it. Uh, below that, on the middle on the right, uh, those white things, those are the cocoons of a wasp that were inside of that horntail caterpillar. Um, so we have these insects feeding on these, these other insects. We also have pathogens. Not only do plants and humans and everything else get diseases, so do insects. So the top left there, um, that is a caterpillar that's been infected by a fungus. A lot of times when people go out into a garden, they see an insect, they think it's a pest, they kill it. So when you're doing your scouting, again, that insect ID is going to be important to make sure you see an insect, make sure you identify it to make sure it's not actually beneficial um, and you don't need to manage it. A lot of times um, we'll get questions about um, lady beetle larva. People think it's a pest and they kill it, but that's something that's going to be going out and feeding on uh, insect pests. And if you've got uh, insect pests, look for those natural enemies. If you have natural enemies, you may not be, need to do anything to control those pests. Give them a little time and those, a lot of times those um, predators and parasitoids can clean up your pest problems. So when it comes to conserving pollinators and natural enemies in our gardens, um, there's some, a couple different things we can do to kind of make our, our gardens and our, our landscapes more inviting to them, kind of encourage them to move in and do some of this pest management for us. So we wanna provide pollen and nectar resources. Uh, a lot of our predators and parasitoids, uh, the adults may be feeding on nectar and pollen. Uh, so lady beetles, that top right picture there, um, has a lady beetle feeding on the pollen of a strawberry flower. If there's not enough insect pests around, they will supplement their diet with pollen. Um, wasps, the same things. The adults are pollinators. Um, they'll go out and catch caterpillars and other insects and feed those to their larva. Uh, plants that have small open flowers with exposed nectaries um, tend to be much more attractive to these. A lot of times these predators and these parasitoids are smaller insects, so they allow, a lot of times they like smaller flowers. So plants in the carrot family, uh, aster family, mustard, and pea and bee families are, are rather popular with these um, insects. If you grow herbs, allowing some of them to go to flower is a good way of providing some of these pollen and nectar resources uh, to these insects. Uh, providing shelter uh, somewhere where they can overwinter, whether that's a brush pile, um, dead tree snags, things like that. If you have somewhere they can overwinter, they're more likely to stick around in your landscape. Um, and then reducing the use of pesticides too. You know, if you're spraying an insecticide to kill a pest insect, there's a good chance it can affect um, our beneficial insects as well. So keep that in mind. And then finally, we have our chemical. So for this, our goal is to manage pests with pesticides. Uh, when it comes to pesticide use, we really only want to use um, when it's needed and try to use selective products. You don't want to use broad spectrum things that kind of kill everything it touches. Try to get stuff that's, that's a little more specific so you don't affect as many insects, particularly the beneficials. Um, use only as much as the label allows. Um, more does not equal better. Um, a lot of times that can cause problems for you. And if possible, rotate chemicals. Don't use the same chemical over and over and over again. That's how we end up with resistance problems um, in our pest insect populations. Now there's a common, I'd say common misconception with organic production in that they do not use pesticides. Organic, organic production does not mean chemical free. You are allowed to use chemicals, pesticides when you're growing organically and they are commonly used in organic production. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, and a lot of times we have this, this kind of false sense that natural equals safe. That is not the case. Um, Nature, nature is an arms race. You've got animals trying to eat plants, plants develop chemicals to protect themselves and just kind of keeps going back and forth. Some of the most toxic chemicals out there are natural. So here's just a slide of some different 
uh, chemicals out there, nicotine, sulfate, and rotenone, those are no longer used in organic production, no longer allowed in organic production. Um, but the LD50 is basically the, the do the, that's the lethal dose required to kill um, half a population that's studied. Um, and it's measured in milligrams per kilogram. So the smaller that number, the more toxic it is. You can see those are incredibly toxic chemicals. Uh, something like carbaryl, um, which you would, um, seven would be an example of that product, um, is kind of 10 times less toxic compared to those two chemicals. Um, Ryana is another natural chemical. Uh, this comes from the roots of a, a plant from tropical um, America. Um, again, is, is more toxic than something like imidacloprid, which is a synthetic pesticide, at least to humans. Um, and this is just looking at the, the acute toxicity, so kind of that one-off toxicity. This isn't talking about chronic, um, which is a whole different story. But the gist of it is just because it's natural does not mean it's safe. Um, don't don't kind of fall into that trap. Pesticides, pesticides are meant to kill things. So just, just keep that in mind when you're using them. When it comes to organic pesticides, um, just some kind of generalities about them. They typically uh, tend to have a short residual activity, so they do not stick around um, a long time in the environment, which is a good thing because um, you have less chance of that affecting non-target organisms, things you're not trying to kill. The downside is they don't stick around a lot. So you have to, a lot of times you have to apply more of them because they don't stick around. A lot of times they have limited contact of it, um, activity. So they have to be ingested. They have to be eaten in order to be effective, which can kind of complicate things. Something has to eat it in order for it to work. Um, less effective on mature insects. That, that's kind of the case for most chemicals we would use in a home garden. The bigger, more mature an insect gets, the harder it gets to control. That's particularly true for a lot of these organic type pesticides. Uh, and they also tend to be more expensive than some of our synthetic uh, type chemicals. Um, regardless of what you use, make sure you read and follow all the label directions. It's gonna tell you how much you can use, when you can use it, what plants you can use it on, what pest it's gonna control, what have you. If it doesn't have a label, something like a home, re home remedy, something you read on social media, something like that, don't use it. Legally, you cannot use that as a pesticide if it does not have a pesticide label. So we'll go through some examples um, of some things you can do to manage uh, some of these different pests in your, in your garden. Uh, so when it comes to weeds, um, you know, a weed is a plant whose virtue has yet to be found. Is it really a weed? That's more, more kind of for landscapes and our vegetable gardens yet. Yeah, if you don't want it there, it's probably a weed. It's competing with your plants um, and kind of potentially uh, reduce the amount of production you have. Using things like mulches, uh, I can say for my garden, I use, again, that cover crop that I crimp, use that as a mulch, and then I will put shredded leaves over the top of that. Not only does that help me retain soil moisture so you don't have to water as often, it also helps keep down weeds um, in my garden. So again, cover crops can do that as well. Um, they can shade out, keep weeds from germinating um, if you put them down in the fall. Shallow cultivation, um, so again, tilling up or using a hose, something like that, um, to dig up um, those weeds. Again, the smaller the weed, the easier it is to control. The bigger they get, the more effort you have to put in control them. So get on top of weeds early. Um, you can do deep tilling. Um, that can, problem with that is that can bring seeds up um, from deeper in the soil up to the surface. So, you know, kind of use that one sparingly if possible. Um, and there are organic herbicides you could use. So vinegar, um, this is kind of a industrial grade, so to speak, acetic acid. Um, it, so your horticultural vinegar is 20% acetic acid. Your kitchen vinegar is only 5% acetic acid. Um, it can cause severe injury to skin and eyes, so you need to use caution when using it. Uh, corn gluten meal is another thing that's organic that could be used. Um, this is a pre-emergent, so it's gonna prevent um, seed germination or kill those small seedlings. Once plants emerge, it does not work anymore. And on some weeds, it doesn't really work on them. It almost acts like a fertilizer sometimes. So again, kind of keep that in the back of your mind if you're gonna be using that. When it comes to diseases, um, again, right plant in the right place. Um, so making sure you've got good soil drainage, you have plenty of sunlight. Um, so, you, know, you may not want early morning shade that makes your leaves stay wet longer, which can increase the amount of disease you have. 
afternoon shade would be, would be better than morning shade. Um, make sure you have healthy plants. So if you're buying transplants, making sure they're disease free, you don't wanna bring problems into your landscape. Again, looking for those resistant cultivars, particularly if you've had issues with certain diseases in the past. Good sanitation, so removing diseased plant material. If you've got a plant that's real disease like this green bean right here, I would just pull that out so it doesn't spread to nearby plants. Um, if you've got a leaf or two that are really badly infested, pick those off, um, get those out of your garden and keep an eye on that plant to make sure it didn't spread and symptoms just aren't showing up yet. Again, doing that good crop rotation so you don't have disease buildup um, in your soils. Mulching can also be helpful. Uh, we think about tomatoes, a lot of our foliar diseases on tomatoes will overwinter in the soil on plant debris. So if you mulch that, it prevents that rain splash that splashes those pathogens uh, up onto your leaves. So you can reduce a lot of your, your foliar diseases on tomatoes by mulching a lot of times. Uh, pruning, either pruning out disease plant material, opening up a canopy so you get more airflow through there so they dry out faster. Uh, proper watering, you wanna try to avoid overhead watering. That gets the leaves wet, creates water splash, which can, which can spread diseases. Um, ideally, you wanna be watering just the soil. Again, sometimes easier said than done, depending on what type of um, irrigation setup you have, but if possible, use drip irrigation or something like that. Uh, and then there are um, organic um, fungicides and bactericides and stuff like that. Um, sulfur, copper, some of the horticultural oils, neem oil, um, can have, um, can work on um, diseases and stuff like that. And then finally, we have our insects. Um, so you can try something like avoidance. Um, so maybe just take a year off, year or two off from growing a particular plant. Uh, if you've, you know, you've got squash bug problems really bad, maybe don't grow pumpkins and squash, things like that for a year or two. Let those pest populations kind of die off or or go elsewhere, then sorry, try to grow again. You can also alter your planting date um, to avoid a particular pest. So if you're, again, if you have uh, something like squash vine borer problems, planting a little bit later in the year, planting your squash in early July, um, and try to avoid when those adult moths are out flying. Issue is though, you get an early fall, you're gonna get less production. So there's, there's a balance there. Um, exclusion, so you can use something like, again, those floating row covers. Um, those are good for, for a lot of the caterpillar pests we have on our, our um, cabbage and broccoli and stuff like that. Since they don't need pollination, you can cover those until they're harvested, keep those pests off them the entire time. Uh, again, making sure you're going out and monitoring for pests. Again, the sooner you find them, the easier it is to manage them. Uh, encourage your natural enemies, so provide those floral resources for them. Uh, making sure you're properly identifying insects that you see so you're not trying to kill our beneficial organisms. Uh, you can hand pick pests. Japanese beetles would be a good example of that. If you've got them on your green beans or they're clipping the silks of your corn, go out every day and hand pick those um, to get them off of your plants. Um, insecticides, again, there are organic insecticides that you can use. Um, BT, so BTK um, is only going to affect caterpillars. Um, so that's a good product to use. Um, if you have caterpillar pests. Um, the there's some pyrethrins you can use, again, horticultural oil, neem oil, insecticidal soaps. Um, a lot of those are going to be labeled for um, organic use. Um, and also be willing to accept some plant damage. You've got a, a hole here and there. You know, you're not trying to, if you're just using this for personal use, you're not trying to sell it. A few blemishes here and there aren't going to affect the quality of the plants. So you don't have to have, you know, and you know, no holes or anything like that. It's okay to have a little bit of damage um, on your plants here and there. Um, and that's all I've got for you. Um, like I mentioned, we do have some uh, for other Four Seasons recordings. We've got some on composting. I believe there's one on cover crops. If you want more information on those, there's um, webinars just solely on those, which give a lot more information than I gave you today. Uh, you can find that on our University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube page. Um, just go to go.illinois.edu slash four seasons recordings to find those. Um, and with that, we can take uh, some questions. We do have an evaluation uh, for this presentation. You can either uh, get your phone out and scan that QR code or go to that uh, website there. Go.illinois.edu slash organic gardening. Uh, 